Author Eric Rees begins by sharing his experience with his first startup business, which ultimately failed. With his startup's failure came the realization that hard work, brilliance, perseverance, determination, and the right product were not ironclad guarantees of success in the world of business, especially in the case of entities promoting innovation. The succeeding decade taught Reese that a large part of a startup's success is dependent on being methodical, not simply on good fortune. The author, then, shares the story of his second startup venture, IMVU, which revolved around a virtual world that allowed users to communicate with each other. This time, he and his co-founders decided to adopt an entirely different approach— partly by having a core product that needed fixing, so that they could better determine what their customers needed. The goal was not to overtly ask the customers what they were looking for in the product being offered, but to develop the product in planned increments over time, to see how the customers would react. This, and other approaches, ran contrary to the conventional thinking in running businesses— But for Reese, the only alternative was to simply apply what tradition dictated, which obviously did not work on his first startup attempt. Origins of the Lean Startup The author shares his early experience in product development and how it influenced his way of thinking in running startups. Because he was too focused on striving to create the best possible product for a specific market before making it available, he encountered failure after failure. He was then compelled to look for ideas in other industries, even those not related to what he was involved in, until he found an approach that he felt would work. He eventually came across the Toyota production system, particularly the concept of lean manufacturing, and how it could be applied to a business that revolves around innovation. Ree's decision proved to be a prudent one. IMVU enjoyed more than $50 million in year-on-year revenues in 2011, just seven years after it began operations. His success caught the attention of others, who advised him to tell the rest of the world about his unconventional approach. He would end up giving talks on what he termed the lean startup way of thinking to other entrepreneurs, major corporations, and even the halls of government. Before long, he made the momentous decision to commit himself full-time to spreading the gospel of the lean startup method, to give businesses that wish to introduce innovative products to their respective markets greater chances of success. The Lean Startup Method The author specifically mentions five principles as fundamental to the lean startup method. 1. The lean startup method can be applied in any business setting, regardless of size or industry. What it means is, aside from those that fall under the generally acceptable definition of the term startup, even larger organizations, or those that have been around for the longest time, can also adopt this approach. 2. A startup requires effective management, at least as much as it needs an effective product. 3. Experimentation is essential to validating one's vision of a product that people will want to buy. 4. A startup should be committed to introducing a new product, gauging and interpreting customer feedback, and then applying learned knowledge accordingly. Again, and again, and again. This is better known as the build-measure-learn feedback loop. 5. Innovation needs to be constantly scrutinized to determine whether it is indeed driving a product's and startup's success. Most startups fail because entrepreneurs, one, give too much importance to implementing plans and strategies that were proven effective in other instances, and two, tend to resort to doing things on impulse whenever application of traditional business theories prove useless. Hence, the author proposes a renewed focus on process management as a means of effectively addressing the unpredictable and rapidly changing situations that startups encounter almost every day. Part 1. Vision 1. Start Entrepreneurial Management 
Entrepreneurs in various industries have always practiced the so-called just-do-it attitude as an alternative to implementing general management, which calls for adherence to process and discipline. There's always been a huge temptation among entrepreneurs to break free of the norm and go one's own way in running a business since it's erroneously believed that doing so will guarantee success. The truth is, the passion and enthusiasm that come with entrepreneurship still need to be orientated along the right direction, with the help of managerial discipline. Otherwise, startups will inevitably encounter deteriorating company and product popularization in just a matter of months. It's this same fate that continues to befall businesses that disregard traditional management practices— and instead foolishly place too much of their faith in a supposedly innovative product that has a 50-50 chance of being accepted by their target market. Furthermore, people's time and skills go to waste in the process, and this will have an adverse effect on their morale. The Roots of the Lean Startup The Lean Startup method is a variation of the lean manufacturing practices pioneered at famed automaker Toyota, by Tiachi Ono and Shijigo Shinigo. Among its key principles are fostering of employee creativity, inventory control, and quicker turnaround times. The Lean Startup Method recommends the application of these principles by entrepreneurs who would otherwise focus unnecessarily on perfecting a product before launch than on gauging whether they hit their targets. The author first uses the example of Henry Ford's internal combustion engine concept to drive home the point of fine-tuning the engine of growth of startups. The proper functioning of the engine depended on various events happening at precise times, such as the firing of cylinders, and these events depended on just how well the prior tinkering was done. Tinkering can still occur even after the engine has been completed, because there are so many moving parts that have the potential to develop problems later on. In a similar way, for a startup to succeed, the people behind it need to constantly tinker with their product, operations, and marketing, even after what they're selling has already been introduced to the market. The second approach the author used to highlight the unconventional nature of the lean startup method is comparing the act of driving a car to the act of launching a rocket ship. Driving a car involves making adjustments whenever necessary, throughout the journey, whereas having a rocket ship reach a specific point entails making a series of precise calibrations before it's launched. The majority of startups fail because those behind them unwittingly follow the rocket ship method, planning to the point of going unnecessarily into too much detail and making assumption on customer feedback even before their products are formally introduced to the target market. Because these firms devoted too much effort to preparing for events in advance, despite the uncertainty, they end up without a game plan for dealing with unforeseen circumstances, and are therefore unable to adapt as necessary. Under the Lean Startup Method, the Build, Measure, Learn feedback loop allows entrepreneurs to make constant adjustments, not only to their products, but also to their businesses as a whole. Incorporating the Build, Measure, Learn feedback loop enables startups to focus on what they want to achieve, while practically leaving the door wide open for how they will achieve it. In other words, it's okay to take unexpected detours, or to reverse course after every wrong term for as long as the destination remains the same. For startups, the destination is termed as the vision. The strategy is the means of achieving that vision. Lastly, the product is the result of the adoption of specific strategy. Product and strategy may change as they undergo fine-tuning in the form of optimization and pivot, respectively. Optimization means actually tinkering with the product to be properly aligned with customer wants, whereas pivot refers to a change in direction while remaining firmly rooted in the end goal that needs to be achieved, i.e. vision. Having such a framework in place basically sends the message that a startup is bracing itself for failure during its infancy, but that in itself is not a cause for concern. 
The road to greatness is laden with failures, and a company should leave reasonable room open for trial and error, for as long as it's willing to fairly scrutinize its own actions and learn from these. 2. Define Who exactly is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is someone who wishes to create a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Thus, entrepreneurs are not only those archetypal young visionaries who put up their own businesses at home with little to no outside financial backing. This term also applies to more experienced people working in established companies that are abundant in reserve capital. If I'm an entrepreneur, what's a startup? A startup is defined as an institution designed to make a new product or service available, even if there's no guarantee that the said product or service will be well received by its intended recipients. That means startups can come in all sizes, whether as a fledgling single proprietor business, a department within a much larger corporation, or even a non-profit organization. The innovation that startups promote can come in various forms as well. It can either be an altogether new discovery, a new use for an existing idea or product, or even simply making an existing product available to a previously untapped market niche. Whatever the situation, it cannot be considered innovation unless the product addresses extreme uncertainty. And because the outcome of introducing a product is unknown, especially in the beginning, the tools of general management are initially thought to be ineffective. And yet some of the tools that fall under that category have a role to play in ensuring the success of startups, despite the prevailing uncertainty. The SnapTax Story SnapTax began in 2009 out of a need to help private individuals pay their taxes more efficiently. The company that hoped to address this need released a product in the form of a software application that promised only a few basic functions. In short, it catered to only a small segment of the total market niche that the company wished to serve. Over time, though, the product evolved into a more comprehensive tool that made filing of income tax returns a breeze for its subscribers. This considerably upgraded iteration was finally launched in 2011, and its first three weeks in existence saw it being downloaded at least 3,500 times. The remarkable thing is that SnapTax was developed by Intuit, a leading provider of finance, tax, and accounting software for small businesses and private individuals. As a large corporation with a 7,000-strong workforce and billions of annual revenues, Intuit hardly fit the traditional definition of a startup. Nonetheless, the team behind the successful app consisted of only five Intuit employees who did not benefit from any outside help from entrepreneurs or any other business gurus. Furthermore, senior Intuit executives allowed this small team greater operational and creative freedom in designing SnapTax instead of micromanaging from the top. Through the SnapTax example, Intuit showed the rest of the world that bottom-up decentralized decision-making is an effective approach, especially when coupled with the right kind of management and cultivation provided by a company's senior leadership to its entrepreneurs. A 7,000-person lean startup. Intuit itself began considering adopting Eric Gries's lean startup philosophy in 2009, when... After nearly three decades in operation, the company was in the unenviable position of seeing its market share steadily dwindle because of underperforming products. After discussing with Rees founder Scott Cook and CEO Brad Smith, they decided to promote entrepreneurship in all of the company's divisions. Product testing ceased being a one-time-only activity, and middle managers were encouraged to give their subordinate employees the support they needed, instead of simply analyzing their output. The results of the paradigm shift were telling. New products began generating up to $50 million in revenue for Intuit in just under 12 months, whereas it used to take the company an average of five and a half years to reach that same figure. Because the company's senior leadership provided the right environment 
and the right tools for employees to make innovative and successful products, the latter were able to experiment as much as they wanted until they were able to deliver no less than what their customers wanted. It was a marked transition from the typical rigid, top-down business management style that Intuit's leadership had been practicing since its inception, but it allowed the decades-old accounting software giant to flourish. During a period of rapid change, it would not have otherwise survived. 3. Learn Learning has often served as a convenient excuse for why a business fails to meet its targets. This, in itself, is not a bad thing, but it would be impractical to think that considerable time and resources are not to be spent on a failed venture purely for the purpose of teaching an organization what not to do. Learning, nonetheless, serves an important role by helping an organization identify what its target market really wants, and it does this through actual engagement with customers, not through forecasts and research. It then works towards providing what customers want instead of incorporating a lot of bells and whistles in the hope that these would attract more people. This method is referred to as validated learning. By finding out more about what the customers look for in a product, instead of simply promoting what it's capable of providing no matter how innovative an organization stands a much better chance of navigating the extreme uncertainty in which it finds itself. Validated Learning at IMVU Reese uses as his example his own experience getting IMVU off the ground. His team began with incorporating an instant messaging add-on to the application to eliminate the hassle of having subscribers switch IM providers, an otherwise costly step in the part of the consumer, and not just in terms of money, just so they could maintain their existing network of contacts. This move only made the situation more complicated as the add-on underwent numerous bug fixes throughout the six months, Rees and his engineers gave themselves to develop it before its public launching. The first version of the add-on product, which was eventually launched, was terrible, in Rees's own words. Worse, not a single person downloaded it, despite all the time and effort put in by those behind it. To remedy this, the IMVU team went about improving the add-on by interacting with prospective customers. But their progress was still hampered by their insistence on incorporating elements that they thought would make for a satisfying user experience. The customers found these to be too complex for them to navigate, and they insisted on, and ultimately received, a product that was much more user-friendly a standalone IM network that did away with add-ons and any other ancillary features meant to improve compatibility across the various IM clients in use at this time. In other words, it was worlds apart from IMVU's initial strategy, which they spent months working on to bring to life. Reese concedes that the lessons the experience taught them may well have been learned through some other way than trying to make a product that was already perfect, even though they had no way of knowing how customers would respond to it. Value versus Waste Value is used to define something which benefits a customer, whereas anything that does not fall under that classification is a waste. In Reese's example, the waste refers to all that his company put in to make a product which the customers ended up ignoring anyway. If the product had been made available to customers much earlier, then all that waste could have been avoided, and the IMVU team would have had more productive six months. Those six months could have been spent actually engaging with the customers and finding out what they wanted, instead of jamming all manner of advanced but ultimately useless, features down their collective throat. Although he did not initially recognize it, the experience also taught Reese that anything that did not revolve around learning what customers want was a waste, and therefore did not warrant inclusion in product development and testing. A startup's success will depend mainly on an actual client feedback dictating the product's final configuration, i.e. validation and not on market research data that become outdated the moment these are published. Where do you find validation? 
Validation comes not from extensive planning in a boardroom, even with the best experts in the industry to which an organization belongs. It comes from the people who will actually be using the product that same organization will provide. With better understanding of what a customer wants comes more detailed knowledge of how the product should be crafted, hence eliminating the long months wherein an organization might be meeting its own internal targets, only to end up with a complex and expensive white elephant. They may be making the most efficient use of their resources, and their output may be through the roof, but it will all be for naught if the customers lack confidence in the resulting product. The Audacity of Zero This belief stems from the assumption that setting definite revenue targets raises the risk of those targets not being met, let alone exceeded. However, with no such targets looming in its collective consciousness, a startup can devote enough time and resources to achieving more concrete progress in coming up with products that customers are sure to patronize. It may seem ridiculous for a business not to set specific revenue goals that would drive its progress, but this can actually help in the avoidance of activities that can be described as waste. Because they are more intent on ensuring customer engagement than they are on reaching milestone after milestone, which under normal circumstances would have told stakeholders more than anything else that real progress is being made, an organization will have no opportunity to resort to fancy and costly gestures, such as prominent PR campaigns, just to convince themselves that they're on the right track. Lessons Beyond IMVU The lean startup method is not dependent on only one critical factor of success, nor is it even a collection of effective tactics in the areas of product development and marketing. It's a systematic way of knowing what customers want and providing precisely that. 4. Experiment Developing a product that customers will want is not simply possible without customer feedback, but with feedback coming in many forms, it becomes challenging to identify only those comments and opinions that need to be prioritized. Regardless, although it is often more effective to launch a product in the raw and slowly develop it over time, than to make it as perfect as possible the first time. This step will not succeed unless there is a committed effort to make good use of valuable feedback. From Alchemy to Science Just as in the scientific method, the Lean Startup method treats as experiments a startup's many efforts to come up with a viable product, which will then lead to a sustainable business. It begins with a hypothesis, stating what the startup wishes to achieve, and this hypothesis is tested over time, with the results gathered and utilized to determine the subsequent experiments to be conducted. Rays used the story of Zappos, which was the world's largest online shoe retailer eventually bought by Amazon, to emphasize the advantage of experimentation over pure data gathering. Instead of striving to put up a large online store with an extensive selection prior to reaching out to customers, Zappos founder Nick Swingmern began with only limited options. Furthermore, he personally handled every aspect of customer relations, from taking orders to accommodating returns. Because Swinmern interacted directly with his customers, his observations painted a far more accurate picture of his target market than what he would have achieved if he had simply conducted a survey among people chosen at random. It also became clear early on that his dealings with customers gave him additional insights on market behavior that he never would have gotten had he resorted to asking people questions that were prepared well in advance. Another example used was that of Caroline Berlin, Director of Global Social Innovation at tech giant Hewlett Packard. Berlin's task was to get more of the company's employees involved in volunteer work in their respective communities. However, she faced problems, chief among which were lack of employee knowledge about the initiative and employees deciding, whether deliberate or unintentional, not to apply their work-acquired skills in giving back to the community.
With this particular volunteer campaign being the first of such an immense size in terms of the number of participants, it would be impossible for Barlin to get it off the ground unless she applied the correct systematic approach. The first step in this was identifying the value hypothesis and the growth hypothesis. The value hypothesis determines whether customers derive value from availing of a product or service, whereas the growth hypothesis tests how a product or service will come to the attention of new customers. To know whether employees thought it was worthwhile to do volunteer work, Barlin studied the numbers of employees who signed up more than once, which was a much better indicator than a survey that was likely to yield mostly vague answers. To find out how quickly word about a particular program spread among the ranks, she took a small number of the old hares, people who were more likely to help uphold the company's vision through their actions, and observed who among these were willing to recruit co-workers who could commit themselves to the same program. Even the worst possible scenario for Hewlett-Packard could be regarded as a significant learning point. Failure to recruit a significant number of employees for community involvement could imply a problem with the strategy. Though the vision itself, in this case using the company's labor force, numbering in the hundreds of thousands as effective stewards of corporate social responsibility, should stay the same. A change in strategy will warrant a re-evaluation of the program and a subsequent re-engineering of it, so that it will be aligned with the company's vision. It seems a monumental effort, but this period of experimentation could take up no more than a few weeks, whereas the traditional strategic planning process in an organization the size of Hewlett-Packard will likely last ten times longer. An experiment is a product. An experiment can be classified as a product because it's the result of the adoption of a specific strategy. RISE uses Kodak Gallery, an online business, to impart this lesson. In contrast to long-standing tradition, Mark Cook, Kodak Gallery's vice president of products, challenged his team to abandon conventional thinking by first identifying a problem that customers have and then coming up with an appropriate solution. Kodak Gallery experimented by first assuming customers would want online-based event photo albums, and then giving them access to a rough prototype, processing only rudimentary features. The prototype was not well-received because of the missing features, but the Kodak Gallery team regarded the feedback as a sign that their hypothesis was indeed correct, that customers wanted online event albums, albeit with more features. The Kodak Gallery team continued the cycle of gathering customer feedback and incorporating the necessary changes to the album app, based on what they had learned. As a result, they strove to keep experimenting with customers, to make sure they had a far improved and potentially more successful product by the time they kicked off their marketing campaign. They completely committed themselves to solving a problem, not to devising solutions for problems that were never there in the first place. The Village Laundry Service Another example Rice uses was that of the Village Laundry Service in India. The Village Laundry Service began as a project of Ashke Mera, tied brand manager for India under Procter & Gamble Singapore. Mera assumed that due to the typically prohibitive cost of owning a washing machine, a significant portion of the population of India would be open to the idea of paying someone else to do their laundry for them. As operations progressed over time, VLS learned of the need to implement additional benefits, such as ironing of clothes and quicker turnaround in exchange for additional fees. The experiment started with small stalls on street corners to service a limited market, but gradually expanded into a 14-stall operation in strategic areas of Bangalore, Mumbai, and Mysore. A lean startup in government? The Consumer Federal Protection Bureau, CFPB, was born out of the need to provide protection for U.S. citizens from predatory lending. 
Upon Rai's suggestion, Anish Chopra, a senior technology officer under the Obama administration, treated CFPB as an experiment to kick off the agency's actual operations prior to its official launch. The assumption of this experiment was that a significant number of Americans who've been victims of financial fraud and other similar crimes will call the CFPB hotline if they know that such an agency exists. To test this assumption, the agency began their operations not by advertising their existence through mass media, but by making their hotline accessible only to those living in a small area, spanning just a handful of city blocks. Even the advertising was limited to flyers, newspapers that served only the chosen area, and online ads. Through this setup, the CFPB was able to test the viability of their assumption while utilizing just a few thousand dollars out of its 500 million operating budget. The CFPB prioritized credit card-related fraud at first, but steadily branched out to accommodate the complaints of other similar offenses. Because the agency took the bold move of establishing a hypothesis and testing it right away through actual operations, instead of purely doing plenty of research and planning beforehand, it accomplished its goal of giving ordinary Americans the chance to express their concerns about those who use the tumultuous financial marketplace to take advantage of others. Part 2. Steer. How Vision Leads to Steering. As already mentioned, the build-measure-learn feedback loop is at the core of the lean startup method. Each of the three components of the loop has been the focus of different departments of a business organization, depending on their area of specialty. However, for a startup to deliver a successful product, it cannot prioritize only one of the components above all else. The focus of a startup should be on the entire process especially on minimizing the total time it takes for the startup to go through the loop. In this manner, there is less room for waste, and thus more opportunities for generating real value for all stakeholders. Establishing both the value hypotheses, do customers find the product valuable enough, and the growth hypothesis, can the product bring in even more customers, will require making so-called leap-of-faith assumptions, but that is precisely what experimentation is for. After these two hypotheses have been identified, the next step is to come up with a minimum viable product for testing those assumptions. The MVP is not simply a rough prototype. Rather, it's designed specifically to facilitate a complete cycle of the build-measure-learn feedback loop, while requiring the least amounts of effort and time. In other words, the product must be functional enough to encourage voluntary feedback from customers. Once the startup goes through the entire build-measure-learn loop, it will then decide, based on gathered customer data, whether to pivot and devise a new strategy, and therefore a new product, or to persevere along with a proven course of action. Since the lean startup method affords organizations the opportunity to pivot, if necessary, much earlier than would otherwise have been possible, there will be less waste and a higher chance of delivering a significantly improved product weeks or even months ahead of schedule. 5. Leap The social network app Facebook has always been an interesting case among startups. Although it was not the first app of its kind, it was, nonetheless, able to garner a significant client base and $13.2 million in venture capital less than a year after it was launched in its most basic form. And it did so without spending anything on traditional pre-launch marketing campaign. The key to Facebook's success can be traced to the willingness of its founders to actively engage with customers as they slowly improved on the product until it became something of tremendous value, with an equally huge potential for growth and expansion. In their efforts to emulate Facebook's success, entrepreneurs behind other startups have become eager to follow the exact same steps taken by Mark Zuckerberg. Dustin Moskowitz and Chris Hughes, back when they were still sophomores at Harvard in 2004, 
However, achieving the same milestones was more than just a matter of not charging customers or of spending nothing on advertising. They proved that experimentation should involve all aspects of a startup's operations that lead to the delivery of a product. Strategy is based on assumptions. Making an assumption is an audacious step. Because a startup will, in effect, be basing its strategy on something that has not yet been proven to be true or false. Thus, in order not to scare off key stakeholders such as investors, employees, and customers, there's a strong temptation among organizations to play it safe while making assumptions. One of the most commonly used approaches in this regard is argument by analogy which presupposes that a hypothesis has a huge chance of being validated as true, purely on the basis that an almost similar case in the past yielded positive results. Now, however, it is common knowledge that making an assumption without ever validating it through experimentation would be foolish. An assumption should also revolve around ensuring both value and growth. Otherwise, a startup will miss out on the opportunity to introduce innovation and will instead find itself implementing gimmicks that are only meant to make themselves look good in the eyes of the stakeholders. A startup may seem profitable on paper, and it may even be benefiting from frequent capital infusions from interested investors. But without the promise of actual value and growth, it will be doomed to failure. Genshi Gimbutsu This Japanese saying may be translated as go and see for yourself, and it's one of the fundamental principles of the revolutionary Toyota production system. In all aspects of business, from manufacturing to human resources, senior managers should make it a habit to base their decisions on comprehensive first-hand knowledge, instead of vague reports from subordinates that stand the risk of being tainted with bias. It was precisely the concept of Genshi Gumbutso that was at the heart of Toyota's efforts in enabling their Sienna minivan to gain a bigger share of the highly coveted U.S. market in 2004. By traveling across all 50 states, visiting small towns and large cities, and interacting personally with ordinary car owners, Toyota chief engineer Yuji Yokoya discovered precisely what Americans looked for in a minivan. His observations led to the manufacturing team to focus on incorporating features that guaranteed the occupant's comfort, especially during long drives. The end result of this step was a market share increase of no less than 60%. Toyota enjoyed a significant advantage because they already knew enough about their customers that finding them wasn't a problem. But what about in the case of startups that have absolutely no idea about who their customers are? Get out of the building. Even as assumptions are based on conditions that have yet to be proven, these still have to have some basis in reality. An organization can achieve this by leaving the safety of their offices and being willing to ask potential customers about a problem they face, not necessarily what they look for in a possible solution let alone a product that promises to deliver such. To get out of the building also means a startup should not limit itself to operating within the figurative walls of its home office. It needs to be open to the idea of continual experimentation and learning instead of working hard to come up with a concrete deliverable based on only one brief period of interaction with the customer. Because human beings, by nature, cannot accurately express what they truly need, continuous engagement is necessary for devising a valuable, as well as sustainable, i.e. growth-promoting, means of adequately addressing their concerns. Analysis Paralysis Many startups make the mistake of building a product after brief interactions with customers that yield only vague and sometimes inconsistent answers. Others fall into the trap of making endless revisions to their plans simply because of a failure to gather accurate data from customer interactions. 
with the idea that too much analysis is just as detrimental as no analysis at all, the lean startup method produces a balance in the form of the minimum viable product. 6. Test As mentioned previously, the minimum viable product, MVP, is more than just an initial prototype. It's a tool for cycling through the build-measure-learn feedback loop with the least amount of time and effort, partly to ensure reduced risk of a startup resorting to activities that will waste valuable resources. As its name suggests, the MVP is only the first step in the continual learning process in which startups engage, particularly the process wherein business hypotheses are validated through experimentation. Why products aren't meant to be perfect? MVPs need not be 100% complete in terms of planned features to appeal to the right kind of customers. In this case, those customers are considered early adopters, their most important attributes being 1. Their willingness to accept an early working prototype even if it had glaring flaws, and 2. Their propensity to inform others about how beneficial the product can be, and why they should also avail of it themselves. There's a certain prestige that comes with being the first in one's family, neighborhood, or workplace to own a new, innovative product, and this is what prudent entrepreneurs always hope to encourage in the right customers. The biggest challenge in coming up with an MVP is determining the extent of its available features in relation to its supposed maximum potential. Yet this exercise cannot be conducted through extensive planning alone. Fortunately, entrepreneurs learn to develop the skill of using their judgment to identify the point just before a product starts to incorporate some trace of excess, which is essentially a form of waste. The Video Minimum Viable Product The story in this example is that of Dropbox, the popular online file-sharing app. In this case, the MVP was not the app, but a video presentation made by company CEO Drew Houston, with the purpose of testing his hypothesis that people would want what they were offering once they saw how it could be used. Houston himself hosted the presentation. He showed in less than three minutes how anyone could effectively execute file synchronization, which was an issue many people have had difficulty doing on their own, and not just with Dropbox. Once customers realized the value of file synchronization, the list of subscribers who were already interested in the prototype app skyrocketed from 5,000 to 75,000 in just a matter of hours. It was partly due to this creative approach that Dropbox is now counted among the biggest tech companies in the U.S. The Concierge Minimum Viable Product The author then discusses Food on the Table, FOTT, a website that helps families prepare meal plans based on whatever's available in the grocery stores in their area at any given time, including items that are sold at discounts. FOTT required an extensive database covering grocery stores around the country and designing the computer algorithm used for suggesting recipes based upon what is available was a monumental challenge for even the most seasoned programmer. In the beginning, however, FOTT had neither. CEO Manuel Rosso and product VP Steve Anderson instead decided to concentrate their initial efforts on just one homemaker to see how their prospect market generally behaved. FOTT was a high-tech offering, but Rosso and Anderson adopted a low-tech approach to engaging their first customer. Instead of interacting with her online, they visited her at home to know more about her preferences, browsed through what was in stock at her favorite local store, and decided on the appropriate recipes. They then handed her a shopping list and menu suggestions, and in return, she would give them feedback, as well as a check for $9.95 for their services. This whole cycle went on week after week. Traditional business thinking discourages such an inefficient use of resources, 
but the exercise gave the FOTT senior managers the knowledge they needed to develop their service into the comprehensive online meal preparation platform they envisioned it to be. They repeated this VIP treatment with a few other customers, until the number of interested prospects grew to the point that made such treatment impractical. The FOTT approach worked because the people behind it concentrated on scaling up proven practices, instead of devising a tool that they only hoped would be effective. Pay no attention to the eight people behind the curtain. Technologists Max Ventisha and Damon Horwitz came up with the idea of a search engine that was similar to the ubiquitous Google, except that it was designed to answer only subjective questions, such as, what's a good place to go out for a drink after the ball game in my city? Obviously, automated technology will fail to answer this, because it cannot accurately account for the preferences of one living, breathing human being let alone billions. The duo came up with five prototypes that ultimately failed to engage their prospects. The sixth prototype, which they named Aardvark, entailed the employment of eight people, who served as the brains of the operation. However, as both Venetia and Horowitz intended, the only thing the customers knew was that they were asking questions to an actual search engine with sophisticated artificial intelligence, not to a group of eight people who did all the work from identifying the customer's respective social circles to knowing where each person in each circle lived, or what they did for a living. Because the customers freely participated in the exercise, the Aardvark co-founders were able to validate their hypothesis that such a service was not only viable, but would also be well-received by people once it was launched. The Role of Quality and Design in an MVP Since an MVP is often restricted to just one or a few basic features and functions, the challenge lies in building just enough that customers would want what's being offered, with the exception that more would be provided. It's a humbling experience for entrepreneurs who have always been confident in their own technological brilliance to fight the temptation to add all sorts of bells and whistles to a product just to draw in as many customers as they can on their first try. By striving to provide the highest possible quality at the earliest possible time, a startup risks incorporating features that customers might not even deem beneficial. Because a startup has no idea yet who its regular customers will be, it cannot simply rely on the appeal of high quality to garner a steady growing user base. Thus, an MVP needs to be designed in such a way that it can help a startup determine who its customers are, as well as what features will provide value to those same customers. After all, A startup's goal is not to provide high-quality product, but to use innovation to establish a sustainable way of doing business. Speed Bumps in Building an MVP Many entrepreneurs are reluctant to field MVPs to their respective target customers out of fear that their original ideas will be more likely to be copied and improved upon by established competitors. Fortunately, a startup can remedy this by cycling through the build-measure-learn loop as quickly as possible and by being more proactive in engaging customers. Another possibility that causes entrepreneurs to hesitate fielding MVPs is the prospect of failure. But that's part of the reason MVPs are built in the first place. No one expects a product that can do it all when it only has a limited selection of features. As already mentioned, an MVP, like other steps in the lean startup method, is merely an experiment and not a startup's end goal. An MVP is meant only to test whether certain assumptions are true, not adequately solve a problem that customers have. Though this is precisely what happened in very rare instances involving MVPs. From the MVP to Innovation Accounting Because a startup is not bound by traditional metrics, it can be difficult to track progress in every cycle of the build-measure-learn loop, 
and to know whether a step that's been taken will bring a business closer to achieving its vision. It becomes even more challenging to measure progress when repeated failures compel a startup to pivot and adopt a new strategy again and again. However, successful entrepreneurs know that being persistent in applying their learnings can ultimately yield viable innovative products, even if the early numbers indicate otherwise. Innovation accounting is the means by which a startup's progress can be measured more accurately as it applies the lean startup method. In any case, even if fielding an MVP does not elicit the desired effect, it is no reason for an entrepreneur to throw in the towel. A failed MVP is merely a sign that a pivot is the next logical step a startup should take towards achieving its vision. 7. Measure Running a startup also entails knowing whether to continue pursuing a specific strategy or to pivot and take an entirely different route. Unfortunately, human nature compels people to be optimistic, even when the situation seems bleak. The obvious danger to this is that any entrepreneur who cannot make honest and thorough assessments of themselves and their strategy will eventually find themselves flogging a dead horse. Why something seemingly dull as accounting will change your life. Accounting was traditionally used as a way of gauging whether the different divisions in a large company were indeed meeting their targets, and this practice stems from the thinking that efficiency automatically equates to eventual success in business. In a startup, such accounting is impractical, because it cannot accurately identify changes in operations, marketing, and sales that have a direct impact on the product. What is instead needed is innovation accounting. Innovation accounting refers to the steps taken by a startup to objectively validate whether they're on the right track towards providing value and achieving growth. Hence, there needs to be a quantitative financial model derived from leap-of-faith assumptions about what the business will look like once it's grown to the point that it is successful in the market. The advantage is this kind of accounting may be used regardless of the size, industry, and objectives of the startup. How Innovation Accounting Works Three Learning Milestones There are three steps to innovation accounting. 1. Establish the baseline. The startup must put together a minimum viable product for testing its assumptions by engaging customers out in the real world. Among other things, the MVP will help the company identify its present status, which is important to monitoring progress. It also makes sense to test the riskiest assumptions before all else. This is because assumptions of secondary importance cannot be tested until one assumption that will determine whether a product will lead a sustainable venture has first been validated. 2. Tune the engine. This step entails determining the drivers of a startup's chosen growth model, improving those drivers, and testing the enhancements through experimentation. When a startup makes an assumption on what will get its product accepted by people, beside its early adopters, the corresponding driver of growth will then be fine-tuned and tested to validate the assumption. The product is merely improved upon in small increments over time and not all at once, although the latter option also has the potential to drive up the customer base The positive effect is almost always brief, and therefore not a plausible indicator of sustained growth. 3. Pivot or Persevere Whether these are sales figures, new customers, repeat customers, or any other quantifiable metric, the resulting numbers that represent a startup's growth drivers following testing are compared to the baseline. If, after testing of a product, a growth driver enjoyed an increase over the baseline, no matter how small, it's an indicator of progress, and is therefore reason enough for a startup to continue implementing its chosen strategy, little by little. On the other hand, if testing reveals no progress at all, that means the strategy is flawed. It's thus time to pivot and adopt a new strategy. 
After a pivot, the company once again cycles through the three key steps. It establishes a new baseline as part of its new strategy, tests a chosen growth driver, and decides whether to again choose a new strategy or to continue along its present path, depending on what it has learned. Innovation Accounting at IMVU The three key steps in innovation accounting were applied in the development of the highly successful IMVU, as Reese himself explains. However, the decision to apply the steps was not made by the startup's founders until several months down the line, when they had already incorporated numerous additional features but were only enjoying a disproportionately small increase in subscribers. Reese admits that their less-than-stellar performance in the market can be traced to their insistence on focusing only on positive feedback throughout the course of determining which improvements to the product were necessary. As a result, they ended up with a product that was easier to use, but not necessarily something that more people would want. As a last resort, IMVU's founders decided to finally engage customers without being selective. This pivot allowed them to dispense with adding high-quality features and instead provide a product that was more aligned with what customers were looking for. The related experiments they conducted in the aftermath of this pivot were all productive in the sense that these stimulated the main growth driver the company decided to focus on. Customers who had initially tried the product for free but then decided to avail of the paid version that promised greater functionality. Optimization versus learning. There's a huge temptation among businesses, startups included, to rely on the so-called vanity metrics to assure themselves that they're making progress when they're actually repeatedly falling short of the goal of building a sustainable venture driven by innovation. A lack of customer enthusiasm will often be blamed on a flaw in product design which in turn will be blamed on the failure of the development team to incorporate enough useful features. However, the more critical flaws are in the company's decision-making process. If a product is not well received by the target market, the first thing that comes to the minds of senior managers is a perceived need to optimize the product further and make it more appealing without first finding out whether such optimization has the potential to bring in more customers. The correct approach involves getting to know the customers well enough to understand their preferences and identifying factors that contribute to the growth engine. Factors that do not often fall under traditional success metrics, such as sales figures, advertising expenses, and departmental efficiency. Vanity Metrics A Word of Caution Positive vanity metrics paint a favorable picture for stakeholders, but do not necessarily indicate that the business is achieving any progress towards sustainability. Rice once again used IMVU as an example to show that traditional growth metrics like increased revenue, new customers, and return on investment simply tell the story that a business was able to make money during a specific period, but was not necessarily learning anything new as far as the product development was concerned. Clearly, a startup needs to rely on a different kind of metric to ascertain whether it truly is in terms of growth. Actionable Metrics versus Vanity Metrics The example used to explain actionable metrics was that of Grokit, a review tool for students about to take standardized tests. Grokit founder Farbad Farb Nivi introduced the app as a means of incorporating the effective aspects of teacher-led reviews, group reviews, and individual self-studying into a single platform that students could use wherever they wanted. The company eventually expanded to include other educational products in its portfolio, but its first few years of operation were wrought with lack of growth, despite the best efforts of the development team and the apparent positive performance, as indicated by steady increases in sales and the number of customers. The failure to achieve lasting growth stemmed from Grokit's senior management not knowing which features of the flagship product they needed to focus on, as well as which features to discard. 
To remedy this, Nivy decided to conduct a split-test experiment by having their customers try out two different versions of the same product. Some of the features the engineers and designers thought to be beneficial were essentially ignored by customers and were therefore dropped from the product's next iteration. Testing also revealed students' preference for a product that allowed them to choose their method of study, whether by themselves or as part of a group. One of the Grocket team's keys to success was the lean manufacturing principle of Kanban, which is similar in structure to the sprint review conducted under the Agile software development methodology. Under Kanban, one a limited number stories or assumptions are selected for scrutiny to determine whether certain product features are necessary. And two, each story is tracked as it goes through the four different states of review. Backlog, in progress, built, and validated. Validation determines through experimentation whether the feature is valuable to customers or is to be deleted from the product's next iteration. Kanban worked for Grocket because it allowed the company's product development team to gauge their productivity in terms of the things they learned, not in terms of which high-quality features they could include. The Value of the Three A's The Grocket story drove home the point that the quantifiable metrics against which startups need to assess their progress must be actionable, accessible, and auditable. Actionable there must be a clear, direct relation between a step taken by a startup to achieve growth and the movement in the corresponding growth metric. Otherwise, a business will risk adding new features or investing in increased advertising only to end up with little better than before. A successful startup is one that is willing to put its vision to the test and revise it if necessary, and its first step in going about this is learning through experimentation which specific actions are the real drivers of growth and which are not. Accessible. This means the metrics used for gauging progress are clearly understood by all who belong to the company. Every employee, not just those from a single department, should know what it means when a certain numerical targets are met, especially the picture of customer behavior that's painted by such figures. It's not enough to simply celebrate the fact that the present numbers indicate a promising future for the company and its product. The company should also know the real stories behind the numbers and exert enough effort to find out which actions on its part have had a direct impact on those stories, especially with regard to fostering growth. Auditable. Whatever data that have been gathered must be verified to see if these have any factual bases. This is a crucial step to informing not only those directly involved in product development, but also all other departments in a company, why a certain project has a success or a failure. Aside from preventing the occurrence of the all-too-common blame game that's potentially damaging to productivity, It helps senior decision-makers understand that data needed to be consistent with reality more than anything else. 8. Pivot or Persevere The growing popularity of the lean startup method gave rise to the misconception that the decision to continue using an existing strategy or to pivot and adopt an entirely new one can only be determined by applying a certain formula. The reality, however, is that human foresight, intuition, and judgment, all of which are non-quantifiable, will continue to play a more prominent role in piloting the long-term course that a startup should take. A scientific approach is applied in the creation of products simply to, one, help identify the areas where human creativity can be put to the most efficient use, and two, further develop human creativity through repeating testing of assumptions. Innovation accounting leads to faster pivots. David Benetti established Votsen as a means of using technology to encourage ordinary registered voters to make the government more aware of socially important issues. 
Following the lean startup method, he began by making assumptions about customer interest in what he had to offer, and then by introducing an MVP that would test his assumptions. The initial results of his experimentation showed only partial success, as the numbers of his main growth drivers were too low to indicate sustainability. He ended up optimizing the product twice over the next 12 months, in accordance with what he had learned from studying customer feedback, but the metrics revealed only marginal improvements in terms of growth. Benetti was forced to pivot, but the good news was that he had no reservations putting his vision to the test, as opposed to remaining firmly rooted in it despite evidence pointing to its futility. He decided to test a new hypothesis, and the result of this was AT2Gov, a tool for facilitating communication between voters and their elected congressional representatives. The MVP for AT2Gov took only four months to build, and the resulting numbers were significantly better overall than those of Watson's most recent iteration. But long-term retention which Benetti had identified as a growth driver, was surprisingly still frustratingly low. Such a discouraging result told Benetti that his idea had little to no potential of earning much from new customers, and this would have forced him to infuse additional capital into advertising, just to keep the business afloat. In effect, making the business grow through more money being invested instead of on its own. Thus, yet another pivot was in order. The next assumption Benetti wanted to test was whether larger organizations were more effective than ordinary individuals in getting the right message across to Congress. The resulting MVP was released in just under three months. It had the functionality he promised the organizations he talked to, but the resulting sales fell far short of his expectations, hence disproving his hypothesis. Benetti pivoted again, this time coming up with a product that would help registered voters find, amongst themselves, people who were willing to bring socially important matters to the attention of Congress. The MVP took just one month to build, but the initial results assured its designers that the service was not only a hit in the market, but also had the potential for lasting growth. It would be foolish to surmise that the success of the final product was simply the result of the startup spending less time putting it together. What it simply means is that the startup had more in terms of the new learnings it could always fall back on, for each time it pivoted, established a different baseline, adopted a new strategy, and built a new way of testing its assumptions. A startup's runway is the number of pivots it can still make. The runway refers to the capital that a startup has for facilitating pivots. Just like an airplane, a startup that runs out of runway before lifting off will never be able to fly. Extending the runway can be done either by raising additional funds or by cutting costs. The latter is the more likely option to be pursued by startups that have very little access to outside capital. For such startups, another alternative is to go to each pivot in less time, which is still practical for as long as validated learning and innovation accounting are diligently practiced. Pivots require courage. Fear of failure and of negative reactions from customers is one of the biggest impediments that prevents startups from making the critical judgment call to stop what they're doing and contemplate a change in their strategy. It's this same fear that prevents them from even testing their assumptions before releasing the finished product. When fear becomes an impediment to a startup's complete cycle through the build-measure-learn loop, it raises the risk of persevering until there won't be enough capital to fund a productive pivot. Entrepreneurs must learn to embrace failure. They must also remember that their goal is not to make the MVP as superb as possible, but to use it merely as a tool to help guide them along the correct course of action. As in the example of the founders of PATH, now a highly successful Silicon Valley company, they lost no time implementing a new strategy following the inability of their MVP to gain enough subscribers in their target market. 
Their new strategy was deemed by an already skeptical tech press as another huge mistake. But the experimentations they conducted in line with this new strategy actually attracted far more customers than what their biggest critics expected. It was a prudent move on the part of Path's founders, and the company has grown to the point that they received and turned down an offer by Google to buy them out for $100 million. The Pivot or Persevere Meeting The decision to pivot or persevere is often emotionally charged, because it compels those running the startup to thoroughly reevaluate a vision that they've always been confident about. Thus, it's necessary for the business leadership and product development departments to hold regular pivot or persevere meetings, so as not to allow emotions to influence the thinking of those who will make the critical judgment call. The purpose of each meeting is twofold. One, to collate updates on optimization efforts and feedback from customers, and two, to compare achievements with expectations— With such data being presented, a startup will be more certain of where it stands in relation to its baseline, and thus be better able to know whether to adopt a new strategy, regardless of whatever positive things it has achieved thus far, or to continue along its present path. Failure to Pivot A startup might be enjoying success in the form of metrics, such as sales and customer base figures, going well above expectations that it may not realize that it's not making any real progress in terms of generating growth. It becomes tempting to stay the course, since money is being made anyway, but it pays to look beyond the things that simply make anyone feel good about themselves and to thoroughly scrutinize whether the growth engine is indeed moving forward. The key here is for entrepreneurs to never lose sight of the need to keep on experimenting, even when everything seems to be going well. This way, should there ever be a need for a change in strategy, it will be identified early on, instead of much later, by which time a startup will have likely already committed considerable amounts of resources into what's essentially waste. A Catalog of Pivots A startup is not likely to be limited to making only one type of pivot throughout its existence. The following are just some of the different types of pivots that startups are likely to encounter. A zoom-in pivot. A product evolves from one feature found in an earlier product. Zoom-out pivot. This is the reverse of the zoom-in pivot. A product ends up as just one feature in a newer product. Customer segment pivot. A startup determines, through testing, its hypothesis that it can solve a real problem of customers. Only, in this case, its customers are those it did not originally intend to serve. Customer need pivot. The product ends up solving a problem of customers that is not the same as the problem it was originally intended to solve, like in the case of the 200-store chain Potbelly Sandwich Shop, which was initially an antique store that only resorted to selling sandwiches as a means of attracting more customers. Business Architecture Pivot A startup switches from a high-margin, low-volume, i.e. business-to-business or B2B sales, to a low-margin, high-volume, i.e. consumer market, business architecture, or vice versa. Engine of Growth Pivot A startup adopts a new strategy for achieving long-term sustainable growth. Channel Pivot A startup decides to make its product available to customers through a distribution channel not normally associated with the product. This is done on the yet-to-be-proven assumption that doing so will be more efficient and thus help reduce costs and cycle times. Technology Pivot A startup employs a manufacturing or development technology besides that which is typically used on an existing product or solution. The decision to make this pivot is influenced by the hypothesis that a change in technology will lead to superior product performance and or price. A pivot is a strategic hypothesis. A pivot is more than a necessary change in approach. It's a way of testing a new assumption when an earlier one has been found to be false. 
Unfortunately, most people do not realize that even the most popular brands of today had to pivot more than once throughout their respective histories. What is seen instead is the innately brilliant founders and CEOs who were able to build thriving businesses because they had good ideas to begin with, which is not necessarily true. Pivots continue to become necessary even when a company has achieved the success it has always envisioned. This is because businesses must strive to remain innovative in some way to maintain their footholds in their respective markets. Whenever a company makes a mistake that threatens its standing among among its customers, a pivot enables it to easily get back on its feet and make better decisions that will bring it closer to its vision. Part three: Accelerate. Start your engines. One of the biggest dangers any startup faces is the possibility that its growth will inevitably lead to dysfunction, because the company will have grown too large and bureaucratic for innovation to take hold. To counter this, entrepreneurs must always be mindful of the end goal of building a business that runs on sustainable growth, even as they scale up their operations. Such a goal is possible only if a startup remains firmly rooted in a foundation built on operational flexibility, an intense desire to learn, and the need to innovate to remain current in the eyes of its target customers. Nine batch. The concept of single piece flow is based on the premise that it's more effective, though not necessarily efficient, to finish building a single product instead of larger batches of the same design. Not only will it require fewer material resources overall, it will also enable engineers and manufacturers to identify any flaws with the design early on. If flaws do indeed exist, then it would cost less to resolve these in just one or a few examples of the product than it is to do so with hundreds or more. The resulting waste is minimized because a startup commits fewer resources to learn the same lessons they would have also learned from making bigger batches. It may be easy for the uninitiated to dismiss the single piece flow approach as counterintuitive. As it fails to maximize available resources, however, it is this same approach that has been practiced at Toyota since its inception, and it has enabled the manufacturing giant to survive in a sea of mass-producing competitors until it became the world's largest automaker in 2008. Small batches in entrepreneurship. Rise often relates his experiences with IMVU as opportunities to put the single piece flow concept into practice. The company's engineers and designers closely coordinated on developing features to be tested on customers, coming up with as much as 50 new updates per day on average. Subsequently, whenever they received feedback from customers, the two teams worked together to identify defects that prevented more customers from signing up. This cooperation also had the benefit of preventing one department or the other from incorporating additional features that tried to conceal the identified defects, or worse, would only lead to more problems. I.e., additional mistakes that would be more difficult for the business to address, mainly because of the prior unresolved defects. With the priority on fixing problems as they come, instead of on adding quality features that customers might want, a startup will achieve true productivity each time it cycles through the build, measure, learn loop. Small batches in action. Rise then relates the stories of two different examples. SGW Design Works, which built a sophisticated yet portable X-ray system for military and law enforcement use for detecting concealed explosives out in the field, and School of One, an educational platform that prepares customized tools for accommodating the learning needs of each student, even in a large classroom with many students. Both ventures became highly successful and even garnered some praise in the press. Because the entrepreneurs behind these products strove to limit batch size to better identify and solve problems with every iteration of development, the large batch death spiral. Businesses that have become rigid followers of tradition often fall into the so-called large batch death spiral, 
because a production batch can be as large as a business wants it to be. Cost and manufacturing capability are the only real limiting factors that determine the maximum quantity of examples to be produced. A company that falls into this trap risks making more and more examples of a potentially flawed design. Instead of devoting enough time to learning and determining whether an idea, in the form of a feature, can positively influence the engine of growth. By the time production batches have grown considerably, it becomes too late to incorporate the necessary changes, and a company will be left wondering what to do with hundreds of examples of a product nobody wants. They had committed valuable resources to creating more and more of a problematic product, instead of taking time out to rethink their strategy. Pull, don't push. Pull refers to the technique in lean production methodology wherein each step of the supply chain simply gets, or pulls, no more and no less than what it needs from the preceding step. This eliminates the need for businesses to maintain huge stocks of products or parts, hence allowing them to adhere to the proven principle of small-size batches. Although it seems inefficient to manufacture just one required part, instead of keeping enormous reserves of readily available parts, it's still a sensible approach, as it effectively forces a business to limit its logistics capability. This will in turn limit potential product excess that could easily become waste, like on the case of products that become less popular over time in the market due to obsolescence. 10. Grow Regardless of product, business model, or customer segment, businesses around the world have been struggling with growth, or rather, lack thereof, in the conduct of their operations. It's relatively easy to achieve initial revenue targets and have a customer base willing to offer constructive feedback. However, these and other early performance metrics do not really indicate that a business is on the right track towards true sustainability, i.e. no infusions of capital from internal and external investors just to drive growth. Where does growth come from? Simply speaking, sustainable growth is the influx of new customers as a direct result of the actions of the past customers of a certain product. Whenever past customers raise other people's awareness of a product, either by overtly talking about its value or by using it, they entice some of those other people to become customers of the same product themselves. Successful startups are able to achieve this after they've conducted experiments to determine the qualities a product should possess to guarantee growth of the business without the need for non-revenue sources of capital. The Three Engines of Growth Perhaps the biggest challenge a startup faces when it finally has a product out on the market is determining which aspect of the product needs to be further developed before all else. The solution is not uniform across organizations, and the people behind each business need to decide wisely on which approach to take, lest they risk creating more waste by spending more time than necessary trying to solve every perceived problem. Fortunately, engines of growth enable startups to concentrate their energies on what truly matters, thanks to a limited number of metrics that guide their efforts in optimizing their respective products. 1. Sticky Engine For a company that has identified higher customer retention rate as a growth driver, the corresponding product must have a capability or feature that would not only appeal to new customers, but would also make existing customers want to continue doing business with that company for a very long time. Viral Engine This engine presupposes that growth results from customers having a positive experience about a certain product and then telling others about it, in effect turning them into prospective customers as well. A company that's identified this as its growth driver should orient its product optimization towards raising the so-called viral coefficient, a mathematical figure that measures the number of new actual customers as opposed to merely prospective customers, generated as a direct result of each customer who avails of a certain product. Specifically, the viral coefficient must be ideally no lower than 1.0, 
which means that every customer who purchases a certain product for their own use will successfully recruit at least one new customer to try the product out for themselves. There are usually incentives for existing customers to share their positive feedback with others and encourage them to enjoy a similar experience. Paid Engine The designated growth factor driver here is the cost of acquiring new customers. For real growth to happen, a company should always find ways to either increase the revenue that's generated each time a product is sold or reduce the cost that goes into sealing the deal with a customer. The numerical figures that are assessed when using the paid engine of growth are the lifetime value, which is the money paid by each customer for a product less variable costs. A portion of the lifetime value can be reinvested in advertising. And the cost per acquisition, which is the cost of an advertisement divided by the number of new customers who signed up as a direct result of it. A company's efforts at optimization should thus focus on ensuring lifetime value will always exceed cost per acquisition for any real growth to occur. An attractive advertising campaign could bring in a lot of new customers all the same time but might lose its appeal among future prospects in the long run, hence making it a poor course of action. Engines of growth determine product market fit. Product market fit refers to the phenomenon wherein a product has gained a foothold in a large market with an abundance of potential customers for that very product. Each of the three engines of growth previously discussed can give startups an approximate idea of just how far they are from achieving product market fit. It's not enough to have positive resulting figures at the end of each product evaluation. The figures also need to be consistent, or better yet, to display a positive trend, indicating that a company has indeed been implementing measures that foster growth. When engines run out A startup can only depend for so long on the early adopters of their product to give their business the momentum it needs to keep growing. To maintain their valuable market share, it will be inevitable for them to have to make the product attractive enough to mainstream customers, who, unlike adopters, are less forgiving of product flaws, such as lack of what they feel are essential features. The trend of growth is likely to stop at this point, and when that happens, the company will become, in a manner of speaking, stuck in the mud. They may still be seeing positive figures in the areas of revenues and new customers, but they'll never again experience sustainability unless they find new sources of growth soon enough. 11. Adapt When the time comes for a startup to scale up its operations, it becomes necessary for additional systems and processes to be implemented to accommodate increased production. One huge danger here is that because it becomes almost natural for a business to transform into a typical bureaucracy that relies on conventional but highly ineffective practices simply because that's what bigger, established organizations have always done. Thus, a startup should change its way of thinking so as to not fall into the trap of being unable to achieve lasting growth, despite an increase in its capability to produce. Building an Adaptive Organization An organization is considered adaptive if it is capable of automatically adjusting its processes and, in turn, its performance to be better aligned with prevailing conditions. It's more than simply growing quickly enough to keep up with fast-changing times. There should also be a commitment to maintaining quality and improving upon it with each iteration of the product it offers. Otherwise, if a significant problem with quality has been overlooked, deliberately or otherwise, for the sake of launching a new product at the earliest time possible, it could lead to even bigger quality-related problems that are sure to further delay the product's introduction to the market. It would be much more practical to resolve such problems as they come instead of incorporating new features out of a misguided notion that quality in other forms can more than make up for existing defects in the eyes of the customers. The Wisdom of the Five Whys The Lean Startup Method gleans another important practice from the Toyota production system, the need to ask why five times 
Asking why at least that many times enables an organization to delve deeper into glaring problems that can impede their rate of growth. Instead of simply taking each problem at face value, an organization must look into the underlying problem caused that problem and the underlying problem before that, and so on further up the line. By identifying and resolving the root cause, instead of simply focusing on the subsequent problems, an organization can, in effect, solve multiple problems all in one go. It can commit less time and fewer resources overall to its optimization efforts, thereby avoiding the risk of over-engineering what is likely to be only partially successful. The Curse of the Five Blames The five whys approach has a 50-50 chance of assuming the form of its counterproductive variant, the five blames. When an organization's performance is less than satisfactory, the people involved are often so frustrated that they'll delve deeper, not to identify and solve the problem and the root of it, but simply to find out who among them is most at fault. Organizations should remember that problems are most often caused not by people, but by flawed systems and processes. Hence, organizations need to be more tolerant of human error, especially for the first few times certain mistakes are committed, and to strive to implement measures to prevent those mistakes from happening again. Measures need neither to be too radical nor too large-scale to be effective. What is important is that these measures adequately address the root causes of problems that could prevent the organization from achieving sustainable growth. The Five Whys in Action Rised used the example of IGN Entertainment, an online media publisher that focuses on the video game industry, because they were intent on achieving innovation and accelerating development of new products. They became a bit too eager to adapt the practice of asserting their progress without understanding the true objective of the exercise. The company thus ended up making the following mistakes. 1. Implementing the five whys approach without first explaining its purpose. 2. Tackling a laundry list of problems instead of concentrating only on a few. And 3. Limiting the number of attendees in each discussion to the point that many key people who were connected to the identified problems were inadvertently left out. After consulting with Rise, IGN decided to give the five wise approach another try. The company chose a seasoned senior manager to act as a five wise master, who would facilitate each discussion. As a result, the second five wise attempt, and all that followed, were more productive. The IGN experience proved that it wasn't just about preventing mistakes and solving technical problems. It was also about fostering a common understanding among the different departments in an organization to ensure continued innovation. Adapting to Smaller Batches The chapter comes to a close with the story of QuickBooks, the ubiquitous personal accounting software. Into it, the company that provided the software went through two agonizing years of failing to achieve liftoff in the market because of, one, failure to appreciate customer feedback and to work on it, and two, inability to disregard traditional but ultimately useless company practices. Into it finally achieved notable progress beginning in the third year since the release of QuickBooks, This was partly a result of deciding to resort to smaller batch sizes and faster cycle times to more effectively conduct experiments and elicit responses from customers as often as necessary. Even engineers who did not normally meet with customers face-to-face suddenly found themselves doing precisely that in order to learn what they needed to do to improve the product's usability. The end result is a product that is now somewhat of a household name in the area of personal accounting software, and it's become so popular that even new updates are made available for download every year. 12. Innovate Even as startups become established companies in their own right, like their bigger, older competitors, they should continue to possess the ability to innovate and achieve sustainable growth. The challenge lies in achieving those two prerequisites even as they strive to maintain market share by meeting the needs of existing customers. How to Nurture Disruptive Innovation Successful startups are themselves products of structure, 
Although structure is not necessarily a guarantee of success, the lack thereof can prove disastrous. The three structural attributes listed below are considered crucial to the success of innovation teams within larger organizations. Scarce but secure resources. The available capital is limited, but every last penny has a huge chance of being put to the very best use. Independent Development Authority An innovation team must be given an island of freedom, in which to develop and experiment with the aim of achieving true learning and growth, not simply of gaining the approval of stakeholders. A personal stake in the outcome Entrepreneurs are more motivated to take risks and commit their resources to validating yet-to-be-proven assumptions if they feel they're given enough credit for being the main authors of successful innovation. Creating a Platform for Experimentation An innovation team working as part of a larger parent organization must be able to conduct its experiments without fear that the parent organization will interfere with the former's efforts. This fear stems from the possibility that a smaller team's often radical means of testing their assumptions can somehow adversely affect the parent organization's standing in the market. A parent organization is therefore likely to engage in self-defense by shutting down certain projects at the first sign of trouble. And this includes projects that have the potential to bring about lasting growth. One solution to this dilemma is the creation of an innovation sandbox, wherein innovation teams are free to use small product batches to test their hypotheses on a limited selection of product development issues, without disrupting the overall business operations of the parent organization. In fact, everything done within the context of the sandbox does not require the prior approval of senior management for it to be implemented, hence giving the innovation team greater freedom of movement and allowing them to focus on ensuring validated learning. Cultivating the Management Portfolio A recurring problem among established companies is their failure to allow innovation to take root in their operations. Even if an innovator has been given the tools to bring about a commercially successful product, chances are that some innovator will be put to task making that product even better instead of creating new products that have at least as much potential to be successful among customers. One way of avoiding this is by giving innovators in a company full responsibility, as well as some form of corresponding recognition, for innovation accounting, which also includes the ability to ensure effective validated learning. As entrepreneurs, they are also responsible for bringing the results of their experiments into the larger parent organization, where these will be further optimized by a different team, with the purpose of attracting a mainstream market beyond the early adopters. That last part is no mean feat, for it often implies going against the time-honored practices by doing something most people would deem too audacious. But it needs to be done if bigger companies have any plans of achieving sustainable growth through innovation. The scientific approach promoted by the Lean Startup Method helps allay the fears among senior company leaders who wish to play it safe by relying on what has proven itself time and again, an eagerness to regularly venture into the unknown and to experiment results in more knowledge that can be used to come up with products that solve real problems of real customers. Furthermore, this could be achieved in such a way that it does not put an entire organization of multiple divisions at risk. Last, cultivating the management portfolio means placing less importance on being efficient and greater importance on achieving validated learning. The goal is not to be able to produce and to gauge results faster and faster every time. It's to cycle through the build-measure-learn feedback loop as quickly as possible. The Lean Startup Method proposes a new way for businesses to run their operations in the 21st century and beyond. It's not about producing more, it's about using creative thinking to provide valuable solutions to real problems. The principle makes a bold move by debunking the same general line of thinking that has all but dominated business management since the early 1990s. As has been proven countless times since then, efficiency is not the only solution to many of the problems customers have. It thus becomes necessary to go out of the confines of one workplace to directly interact with the market 
to know precisely what it needs, and then actually work towards providing an adequate solution. The ultimate objective is not a product that performs as advertised, but a business that can continually adjust itself to meet people's changing needs. Perhaps what is most remarkable about the lean startup method is that it can be understood and practiced by anyone, regardless of their role in an organization. The knowledge it teaches is not exclusive to senior managers, nor to those few individuals who seem to have been gifted with technological brilliance. It encourages even the most junior employees to use their own creativity and potential to question the status quo and find out how they can make innovative working solutions for people. It empowers employees by giving them a unique opportunity to participate directly in ensuring the company's sustained growth, instead of having them take on seemingly mundane tasks that have no significant impact on that same growth. Employees become more confident in themselves and in their ability for as long as they know they're working towards providing something of real value. It must be understood, however, that the lean startup method is not a rigid step-by-step process that's to be followed to the letter. It simply provides a guide for organizations to effectively test their assumptions in as less time and using as few resources as possible. Not only does this enable them to learn whether their actions have a lasting positive impact on customers, it also allows them to make commercially viable products available at the earliest opportunity. They end up with considerable time and resources to make their products at least a little better for customers with each iteration, whereas companies that are faithful embodiments of efficiency will likely rely on all manner of fancy but ultimately unwanted features just to gain the approval of stakeholders. The Lean Startup Method encourages everyone to challenge conventional thinking and to be more curious about the things they do, as well as the world around them. This is because it is more practical to investigate further to know why some measures work and why others don't, than to simply either credit success to sheer luck or give up at the first sign of impending failure and use the cliché of lessons learned as an excuse not to exert any more effort. People would be doing themselves a great disservice by refusing to make the best possible use of their creativity and their ability to experiment and innovate. Without these attributes, we would essentially all be automatons that are trained to just keep making greater quantities of things that will ultimately have only temporary and negligible value.